this next topic uh, is uh, discussing shaft deflection. Okay, so there's often two different things. There's actually more than that on, on occasion, but there are two really big things that are often important to us when we are doing design. Um, one of them has to do with stress, and so that's what we talked about last time, and specifically with shafts, stress can lead to uh, issues of fatigue, and so that's why we did that problem last time. Um, what we're moving into today is a discussion of another way that a shaft can fail, and that has to do with excessive deflection. And so I wanna just mention this real quick right here at the outset. Um, you don't actually have to have a part uh, experience, say, permanent, def permanent deformation um, or, uh, or even fracture or anything like that for there to be a failure in a machine, okay? Um, there are other ways that a machine can experience failure. Like, let's say you have a part that it's okay if it deflects a little ways, but if it deflects too far, it might get into the path of another part of the machine and you could end up destroying something because something deflected too far. Uh, an example that I heard of one time was, a, you know, someone installed a fan um, in, a, uh, in a car and the, uh, the fan was not stiff enough, all right? And so that as the fan started to pull air, air deflected a fan blade and the fan blade actually made contact with the radiator of the car, all right? Because the fan was under designed and it actually deflected too far. They put it too close to the radiator and it would end up hitting the radiator. Um, didn't see it myself, but that was a story that was told to me and it's one that I think of, is that you know, if something deflects too far, it can very easily get into a space that it's not supposed to be and then that can be a problem. Another example that we're actually gonna to touch on a little bit today is that, um, you know, and this is actually very apropos to shafts, a shaft is uh, responsible for holding its components, the components that are installed on the shaft. It's responsible for holding those uh, at least to some degree where they belong, all right? But the shaft, shafts, there is no such thing as a perfectly stiff material. And so shafts deflect like any other mechanical element would deflect. And uh, some examples you might actually see on page 371 in your book, it shows you some deflection guidelines that you know, if, if you go beyond a certain amount of deflection, it can cause problems with respect to certain kinds of shaft components. For instance, uh, when gears mesh with one another, if you allow the angle of those gears to not be straight on, like if you allow them to angle one way or the other, what do you think would happen in that case when gears are meshing? It's gonna have uneven wear, right? You're gonna have a wear more on the side that's contacting more, okay? So that's, that's not a good thing. It's also true that actually, you know, for gears that have involute teeth, we'll get into that later in the course, but it's the shape of the teeth that uh, compose most gears, that makes them actually somewhat, um, you know, not as sensitive, we'll just say, to uh, movement away from one another, right? They can actually withstand a little bit of deflection so that they don't have to be mated at exactly the center distance that it may have started out. But it is only so uh, resilient to that effect, right? You, at some point, they go far enough apart and you start having a problem. And there's actually guidelines for that also given on page 371 of, uh, of Shigley here. So um, anyway, these are things that matter to us with respect to shafts. We a lot of times care uh, how far a shaft might deflect under the load that it is expected to carry. So here's the problem we're gonna do today. Um, we are gonna do a problem that involves having a uniform diameter shaft that goes all the way from one bearing to another. You see here on the picture, the bearings are at the ends of the shaft. Uh, I've got an eight inch spacing on the front side and a six inch spacing on the back side. The diameter of the shaft is 0.74 inches. The diameter of the gear that's installed on the shaft is two, is, uh, well, it's, the diameter is four inches, the radius is two inches, okay? And then the gear that it mates with up above that has a radius of one inch or a diameter of two inches, okay? And uh, in the process of, you know, transmitting torque from, you know, let's say this is a motor up here or something, right? In the process of transferring torque from that motor to the shaft down below, it actually has to push with 
a contact force between those two gears. And so I've said down here, let's say that that is actually supplying a 100 pounds of contact force. I'm doing this in the interest of time so that you can, you can get right to the crux of the problem, but it isn't uh, that hard for us to calculate how much contact force we would need for a given amount of torque transfer, right? How would that work, you think? Well, the, the way you would do that is you would actually decompose the contact force into a uh, radial component as well as a tangential component. The tangential component is the one that transmits torque, right? And you can kind of ignore the radial component uh, in a sense in terms of transmitting torque because the radial component would actually have a line that goes straight between one and the other. So that isn't going to create torque around either of the shafts, the component that goes along the radius the radial direction, it's only the one that goes along the, um, that tangential direction that's going to be transmitting the torque. So you take the component of that 100 pounds of contact force uh, and multiply it by the radius and that would be the torque that would be transferred. Does that make sense? Okay, the other piece that kind of goes into this is, let's say that these gears have a 20 degree pressure angle, okay? Um, I'm not sure how much of this you have seen to this point, but when gears mate with one another, uh, the model that we have looked at with respect to gears up till now in some of your earlier courses is we've pretty much kind of ignored this idea that there even is a radial component that tends to push the gears apart. We've looked basically purely at the tangential component. Okay, well when real gears mate with one another, okay, and I'll actually draw a little picture here so that this makes a little bit more sense. Uh, when, when real gears mate with each other, you don't look at there being just a tangential component on one piece and a tangential component on the other piece, right? Even though that's the component that does the torque transfer, right? There's that, that component right there. There is also, uh, and I really should maybe separate these. Let me, let me separate these two apart, okay? Not only is there this you know, equal and opposite tangential component that happens right here, there's also a component that tends to push these two gears apart like this. And the fact that there are both of those components leads to the idea that there is a predictable pressure angle, it's called. And it is basically the kind of the angle that's implied by the, two, the, the relative magnitude of those two components, all right? And so this pressure angle right here um, for various kinds of uh, gear standards, um, there aren't that many pressure angles that gears are designed to transmit, all right? These, there are standards out there that uh, kind of define what some of these pressure angles might end up being. And so I'll mention a few of them. There's, these are the most common ones are 14 and a half degrees, that's an old standard. Not very many gears are, are built that way anymore. Most gears today are either 20 degree pressure angle or 25 degree pressure angle. Some of them even go up to some, some gear standards have a 30 degree pressure angle, okay? But the ones we're dealing with here, the, it's given here, this gear has a 20 degree pressure angle, which means that this angle right here is 20 degrees. And that also means that you would have a 20 degree pressure angle up here on this other gear as well, okay? So I felt like I should mention these, this background stuff because one of the things that you'll see when you do the problems that I have you work is I will usually go ahead and say that these uh, you know, pressure angles for any gear set that I'm gonna have you look at, I'll use one of those numbers and I want you to know that that's not by accident. I'm kind of showing you numbers that do exist in real gear standards that are out there. Okay, all right, well how would that show up um, when it comes to looking at this uh, shaft that is being driven by the motor? Okay, tell you what, just to make it less ambiguous, let me, uh, let me actually redraw that. So here's a gear. Okay, it's got an eight inch spacing up here. Right, eight inches here and six inches back here. All 
All right, and how does that force get applied to that shaft? All right, I'll go ahead while, we're, while you're thinking about that, I'll put in my uh, reactions at the bearings. Okay, those aren't really part of what I really need us to look at for now, so we'll just show them there so that we don't leave them out. How do I put this force on there, you think? It's 100 pounds of contact force, I would say, you can do that by drawing a kind of a tangential line like this, and you can say there's a force coming from that upper gear that pushes on this gear right here of, and that was a given value of 100 pounds. And it's happening at an angle of 20 degrees. Okay. The other thing that I showed on that original picture was if, if I don't do something else, then uh, this is not a statics problem, and I don't want to get into it being a dynamics problem at this, at this stage. So let's say that there is also a um, reaction torque that happens at the other end of the shaft that reacts against whatever applied torque is happening because of the 100 pounds being applied right there. Okay, so that's a... Uh, reaction torque, I'll just call it T sub R maybe. Okay, so there is what I've got. Now the question is, how much separation happens between the two gears? And we'll simplify it a little bit and just look at the bottom one. This is a, not a bad assumption to make in certain cases. The reason that this might be an uh, acceptable assumption to make in this case is that if there is a lot less um, say cantilevering or, or just space between the supports and where the gear is, then that amount of deflection starts to go down, 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 right? So based on the picture that we have of the motor up here, it looks like that gear is spaced really closely to the motor. And at some point, if that is small enough, then at some point you might be able to say, well, I think that's probably gonna be negligible relative to the amount of uh, deflection that happens in other parts of the system. Down here, you have an 8-inch spacing and a 6-inch spacing, and it looks like you're probably going to end up with a, a bigger amount of deflection for that bottom shaft, okay? So the other reason I'm doing this is just so that I don't have to do too many different problems all at the same time. So you, if you had enough information and data, you could do a very similar analysis to what I'm doing right now for that upper shaft, and then we can get a more complete answer. All right, so uh, question. Where do we go from here? We're supposed to determine the amount of separation that happens between the two gears. And we know the diameter of this shaft is 0.74 inches. All right. Where do we go from here? OK. Maybe, so I think one of, the, one of the suggestions here is that we could take the contact force and we could break it into components. Is that kind of what the suggestion might be? All right, that is tempting, and there actually are a number of cases where that is important to do, okay? Those cases would involve shafts where you have more than one load applied to the shaft along its length, okay? Um, in those cases, what you would typically do is you would take your shaft and you would view the shaft from one set of axes. Let me go ahead and actually name my axes here so that um, I, can, I can talk about them. Okay, let's say that I have, um, let's say this is, uh, I don't know, I'll call this X, I'll call this Y, and I'll call this Z. Okay. And so what, one of the ways that you can deal with this, if you have multiple loads acting on the same shaft, is you can look at it from the standpoint of just, let's say, the YZ plane, in which case you would look at loads that would happen in the Y direction, and you could evaluate deflections that happen in that Y direction, and you could then do a separate analysis for the X direction and see how much it deflects in that direction too. Uh, that is a more generalized way to handle something like this. But if you have a case where you just have one load applied like this, what you can do is you can sort of imagine there being another plane 
and look at just the deformation in that plane. And here's why. When you have this 100 pound force applied like this, uh, there is a principle that you can, as far as the, the static reactions of a part or assembly like this, you can take that force and move it to a different location as long as you accompany it with another, with, with a couple or a concentrated moment that you also add when you move it there. Let me show you how that works for this case. So we can take this 100 pound force and imagine it not acting here, okay? So you kind of say, let's pretend that 100 pound force doesn't act right there. And instead, let's view it as if it acts at the center of this thing, okay? Now it acts in the same direction as it did before, okay? So what we can do there is we can still say that it's going to have a 20 degree pressure angle like this. That's okay to do. It's going to have a similar effect on uh, the deflection of the whole shaft and everything. But if we want to be complete with it, there's another step that we need to also do, and it is to add a moment that would have existed if we had kept the force where it started, like where before I did this equivalent force couple system that I'm going to add whenever I move it to this new location. And that's not actually that hard. All you got to do is add an additional concentrated moment about that new point that you moved the force to, and then say how much moment that would have been. Okay, so how much moment would that have been? All right. Well, it would have been 100 pounds times the cosine of 20 degrees gives you the amount of tangential force that would have acted up here, right? That was, that was this tangential component, would have been 100 pounds cosine of 20 degrees. You take that and you multiply it by the radius of that gear, and it gives you the amount of couple that you would have right here. So, I mean, we can calculate that real quick if we want. 100 pounds times the cosine of 20 degrees times two inches of radius there. And that gives me 187.94 inch pounds. And as far as its effect on this shaft, there's no difference between having the 100 pounds applied where I showed it up there and now the 100 uh, pounds where I've moved it to, uh, along with that couple that I'm also adding. So this is a principle of uh, you know, a force couple system, and you can move a force around as long as you accompany it with a couple. All right? Now, I calculated that. It ends up not really mattering, because I don't really care about the torque aspect of this problem. I care about the flexural deformation of the shaft. So I did calculate it, and it would be important to us if we were dealing with the torsional aspect of this problem, but we're not. We're looking at just the deflection part. And so now what we have is a 100-pound force applied at the center of this gear, and what I'm suggesting is that I should be able to kind of act as if there's a plane that passes, you know, this plane passes through the Z. It's like a plane that's oriented along the Z, but is rotated down to where now it contains this 100 pound force. Okay, does that make sense? And that's the plane in which I am going to evaluate the deflection of the shaft. All right, again, let me reiterate, this works as long as you have one force applied. All right, if you have one uh, location where there's a force applied, then you can do this. It becomes more difficult if you have more than one force that are applied in sort of any general direction. You actually can do it for more than one force as long as all of them act in the same direction, right? But uh, if you have more than one force that act in multiple different directions, then you, you probably need to split it and look at deflections in two different planes. All right, so now what? Now we know that we have 100 pounds applied at the center of this shaft. Uh, you know, at the center of the gear, not really at the center of the length of the shaft. So now what? Okay. You could come up with a maximum bending moment, but uh, you don't necessarily need to. OK. 
Okay? The reason why is that um, there are a number of deflection equations that are provided for you in this text. All right? You might remember back all the way to the, the uh, first statics mechanics materials class that you had uh, that you saw uh, that there were tables in the back of the book that gave you the amount of deflection. Right? And then you used those in a method called what? Remember? Superposition? You remember doing shaft deflect, or you did beam deflection at that time by superposition. Well, we can do that same thing now, and we have tables that are in the back of the book. So if you actually flip back there, um, there is, I believe it's A9. There are a number of different kinds of cases that are identified. And we need the one where we have a concentrated load applied to a simply supported beam. Right? That's what this case is. It's a, simple, it's a simply supported beam with a concentrated load, um, but not right in the middle. And as I look through these options, one of the things I see is case 6. Uh, if you have edition 10, it's going to be on page 1023. Okay? And you will see that there is a, uh, an equation that gives you the deflection. All right? Um, and it gives that to you as a function of things that we can find for this, uh, for this case. Okay, so you might actually look at, uh, you know, it gives you YAB and then YBC. You might see in there. Okay, why does it have two different formulations? You think? Okay, one of them. These are these are actually equations that give you the shape of the, the elastic curve of that beam. And so one of these is ap applicable between A and B, and the other one's applicable between B and C. What point do we need? Uh, yeah, either one will work because we need point B. And either one of these equations will actually allow you to get that point B, okay? So we, we shouldn't have any problem using either one of those equations since the place that we want is uh, right there at the transition between the two. All right, so let's go ahead and write down this equation. All right, I'd like to use one that's, uh, that's more simple. All right, that would be my preference. So let me write this one down. FBX over 6EIL. F B, X over 6, E, I, and I'll put a capital L there to make that clear. This is basically, I'm going to not use Y, I'm going to call, because it's not acting in the Y direction. This is acting in this direction that I defined a second ago, this deflection plane, right, that it's actually moving in. So I'll just call it delta for how far did it move, all right? And then this gets multiplied by x squared plus b squared minus l squared. Okay. And now it's basically just plug and chug. We need to just make sure that we are accurately putting in the, uh, the values that we know for this case. Uh, we know that it's a carbon steel shaft. That allows us to find E. And... Uh, you know, you will you'll probably remember from using this book in, uh, you know, advanced mechanics materials, but we don't try to uh, zoom in too far on our materials. We basically, you might remember that we have this uh, constants table that we have on page 1015 that gives us things like modulus of elasticity and modulus of rigidity. For carbon steel, it says it's 30 MPSI, okay, 30 million PSI. Um, and as long as you know it's carbon steel, we're just going to assume that that's the value, and it's going to be close enough for whatever kind of carbon steel that you might encounter out there. Um, so that's what E is, all right? I don't know why I started there, but 6 times 30 times 10 to the 6 PSI, okay? What's F? 100 pounds, okay? We don't split it into components because 
100 pounds is the force that acts in this direction that we are evaluating the deflection in. Okay, so you just leave the entire value there. That you would do that differently if you were handling two different planes separately. But in our case, we're handling it all in one plane. All right, then we've got B. Okay, we've got to look back at our picture here. And uh, B, you will see, is uh, the amount of length that you have that is on the opposite side to where we are evaluating with this equation, okay? So for us, that B value is going to actually be our six inches because we are evaluating this uh, in the, I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter. You could actually flip this around mentally and do it a different way. Um, it should end up giving you the same answer. So let me actually think about that for just a second. So we have, um, Let's actually do it to where we're defining it relative to the origin, in which case I would want to use B as my 8 inches. Okay. And what's X? 6 inches. Okay. What about I? Okay, this is also one that may have left you over the summertime, uh, but when you're dealing with a circular piece, uh, with a circular cross section, the I value for that is going to be pi D to the fourth over 64. Okay, some of you remembered it, I'm proud of you. Okay, pi D to the fourth over 64. Those are also somewhere in the back of the book if you need to look them up, but that's one that I definitely recommend that you sort of don't lose mentally, because we use that one a lot. Okay, what's D? The diameter of this thing is 0.74 inches. Okay, and that's raised to the fourth power. All right, and then what? L. All right, L, if you look at the picture here, is the overall length between the two supports. And so what we have here is 14 inches. All right, then what? Okay, so X again was six inches, right? So we have six inches squared. What's B? Eight inches. That gets squared. And then, of course, we have our 14 inches. And that's squared. Yes. Yes. Thank you. I should have not put that up there in the numerator. Thank you for catching that. The absent-minded professor. Yes, sir. Okay. The reason why that's X is that if you look at this picture over here, um, X, we're measuring that relative. This is the picture on uh, on page 1023. Okay. You're measuring that uh, where A is the dimension that's closest to where X starts out. Do you see that? And so. If we want to figure out what the x coordinate is of where the force f is applied, then for our case, since we're taking the, you know, our x direction basically matches our z direction, right? Then you would have to have a coordinate of six inches along the x to match what what the book is mentioning right there. Okay. All right. So we, when we actually punch all of this, all of these numbers in. What this tells us is that our deflection is going to be equal to 0 0.0124 inches. Okay, hopefully you trust me on that. Um, occasionally I might pull out the calculator and show you a particular calculation. I think that kind of gets boring for people, may not be the best use of our time, so I won't do that every time. Yes, sir. 
OK, positive versus negative, right? This is a, an interesting thing to bring up, so I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, can you think of a reason why that would end up negative if you actually punch this in this way? Yeah, if you look at this picture, they're actually assuming in this picture that f is downward, right? So if you put in a positive value for f, then you're going to end up with a negative value for your deflections because the direction of f is the opposite of the positive direction of y, OK? This is an issue we don't really care about because all we want to know is just how far did it move, right? So we can just sort of ignore that sign that comes out of that. But there's a good reason why the sign shows up, and that's it right there, OK? So a good, uh, if you want to make that not be that way, you can just say, well, you know, for this to come out positive, so that whatever direction the f is, that's the same direction that the, that the delta happens. All you have to do is just put a negative sign in front of the f, in which case that brings it back to positive for our particular case. Yeah? The reason why is that we, in, we are not uh, looking at a deflection in the x nor a deflection in the y. We are looking at a deflection in the direction that the pressure angle is pushing. Right? So that means we get to take the entire amount of force, and that entire amount of force leads to that amount of deflection in that direction. Okay. If the pressure angle was zero, then all the deflection would be in the x direction. Right? So, um, yeah. Right. You, the gear can be turning, and that's okay. The gear can be turning, but steady state, uh, which will happen, you know, it's not going to be accelerating or decelerating, right? as long as we have the correct amount of resistive torque applied, like I said at the beginning, let's say whatever resistive torque you need, which would be this 187.94 inch pounds, right? As long as you have that resistive force resisting the applied, or excuse me, resistive torque resisting the applied torque, then it's not going to accelerate, okay? And in that case, then you can, as soon as you know it's not accelerating, you almost don't care that it's even moving, right? You can still look at the kind of this steady state deflection that's going to happen. Yes? Um, so that force, that only happen whenever it's turning, or is that due to the position of the motor going to the other gear? So I think the question is um, the, the force of 100 pounds applied in that direction, is that because it's moving, or is that because of the positioning of the motor where it is positioned? And the answer is it's because of the position of the motor. All right. Um, we don't really care what speed this is turning. As a matter of fact, this could be stationary. It could be a static torque that you're applying on one end and a static torque applied by the motor. Our, our uh, conclusions here don't change relative to if it's spinning at a constant speed. All right. It only changes once we, if, if we get to a position where it is spinning at a non-constant speed. Right. And then we have. Uh, a, a, a dynamics problem that we have to solve first. Okay. Yes, sir. So would this be assuming standard when doing deflection between gear sets is that it could be in the direction of the pressure angle? So the, the absolute motion question is, um, is, is the motion of this thing going to be in the direction of the pressure angle? Is that kind of the question? Right, so um, the question is, I'll, I'll rephrase it, uh, is this the method that we should use when there's deflection between gear sets? And I would say this definitely, you know, that pressure angle is the force that's being applied to the, to the gear. So yeah, that, that would be the direction that it would want to deflect, okay? Um, now you can decompose it. I've mentioned this a couple times, I'll say it again. You can actually do this as an amount of deflection in the X you know, by taking just the x component of that pressure or of that force and then do another deflection that would be in the y, and then you could combine those together and figure out how far it actually overall moved. But it's in these cases where you just have one force being applied, one of the ways to do it is just to handle that um, in the direction that the force is actually being applied, which is what we're doing. Okay? Good questions. Anything else? 
we can hit, yes. Ah, perfect segue, okay? He says, how is that a separation between the gears? This value that we just found of delta, 0 0.0124 inches. And the answer is, it is not. That's the next part of our problem, okay? This is not a separation between the two gears. This is how far did the lower gear move? How far did the center of the lower gear move, all right? And so it would probably be helpful for us to kind of picture this with another little um, diagram and say, what if we have, I'll, you know, I'll draw them dotted here. Let's say I have my upper gear here and I have my lower gear down here. Okay. I have a one inch radius from the center of the upper gear to where these two things mesh and I have a two inch radius from the center. So this is one inch, this is two inches. Okay. And what we just found with that point zero one two four inches is actually a deflection that happens in the, whoops, in the direction of that pressure angle. So this little length right here, and I've, I've exaggerated how big it is so that I can draw a nice triangle here, but this is 0.124 inches, is how far the center of the lower shaft has moved in response to this 100 pound force. Okay. And so the question there is, well, how far have the gears separated? All right. We assume that the radius of the gears won't change. All right. It won't change appreciably. It won't really change much how, how far the radius is of the gears. And so what we really need to do is figure out what is this new center distance because of how the lower shaft moved. All right. It shifted over because the, the shaft deflected. And the fact that that shifted over um, allows us to find, you know, what this new center distance might be. Well, how do we do that? Okay, someone says geometry. Geometry is our friend. Okay, a couple things here. First of all, I'll say I can draw a line right here, and this angle is my 20 degrees. Okay. Agree with that? Okay, that means that this angle right here is how large? Okay, well, it's 90 degrees plus 20 degrees, right? So that's 110 degrees. Okay, now where do you think I might be going with this? There's a, there's a really, really handy geometrical relationship that if you're not familiar with by now, I'm going to do what I can to make you familiar with it. Law of cosines. Law of cosines. Okay. This is one that's definitely uh, worthwhile knowing. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you. Y'all are going to keep your uh, absent-minded professor in line here. I, I do appreciate that um, because... I don't notice when I make, you know, when I draw, when I write errors up here. It's one of the reasons I like doing this better in front of a live class is I've got a thousand, not a thousand, but I've got a good number of eyeballs helping, <laughs> um, helping me not make these mistakes. All right. So now what? Okay. Let's law, let's write the law of cosines formula. Okay. And we'll do that so that we can find this side over here. First of all, let's say. Um, you know, here's the law of, of cosines formula. C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared minus what? Okay. 2AB cosine of some angle. Okay. And this, you know, this works. I'll kind of give you the general idea here for a, uh, for a triangle. 
this is when you have C over here, you have A right here, you have B right here, and you have the angle that you're looking at right here. So the angle is going to be the one that's opposite of where the, uh, you know, that final C length is being measured, okay? So for us, okay, let's kind of, we may as well name this thing C. C becomes a square root of what? Okay, one plus two is three, right? So we have three inches squared plus, what's B? Okay, 0 0.0124 inches squared, then what? Okay, times the cosine of 110 degrees. All right, and so what we need to do, I think I ran out of notes here, so I think I'm going to go ahead and plug this in. So we have a square root of 3 squared plus uh, 0.0124 squared minus 2 times 3 times 0.0124 uh, times the cosine of 110. Okay, and that gives me 3.004264. See, four two six three six. We'll say. Okay. So, how far have the gears separated? Yep. Okay. All right, so now my question is this. Um, is that okay? Is that too much separation? All right. Well, let's flip over here uh, to page 371, and you'll see here it says typical maximum ranges for slopes and transverse deflections. It says down here transverse deflections, spur gears with the pitch value being less than 10 teeth per inch then you shouldn't have any more than 0 0.01 inch worth of uh, center distance deflection for that kind of gear, okay? Between 11 and 19, 0.005 inch. Between 20 and 50, 0.003 inch, okay? So what I would say is it looks like that might be within our, our range of acceptability as long as we have um, a pitch value that's not too large, right? A large pitch value means you have small teeth. It's a large number of teeth per inch of size of the gear. Yes? This is table 7-2. Okay, so I'm going to actually show you a, kind of a second part of a similar type of a problem like this. Um, and we can use an equation that's here in the book uh, to apply something that's known as a, uh, a design factor, all right? So let's say that you wanted to set this up, okay, and, and I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll kind of give you some more information. Let's say that you have uh, spur gears with pitch uh, equal to 12, uh, let's say 12 teeth per inch, okay? And if you're wondering where I'm getting this, I'm just making it up, okay? Let's just say that that was another piece of information that was given to you in the problem, okay? So if you have 12 teeth per inch, where does that put you in table 7-2? All right. 
we can have up to, okay, your max allowable separation would be 0.005, okay? But let's say I also give you another piece of information, and that is you are supposed to apply a design factor of 1.5. Okay, and now what, we're, what I need you to do is find the minimum diameter for the shaft. Okay. So if you flip over um, to page uh, 373, there's an equation there. Equation 718, let's see, not seven, 717. Okay. Equation 717 says that you can apply a, uh, a technique where you find a new diameter if you have an original diameter, it calls it D-old, okay? What you have to do is you have to take your design factor, they call it N sub D here, and you have your old deflection over your allowable deflection here, and you take all of this to the one quarter power. Okay. Well, how does this help us, you think? Yeah, we don't have to go all the way back, right? We can just uh, handle, handle this problem like right here. Okay. So here's what we do. We say we started with a 0.74 inch diameter there. Okay, we want a design factor of 1.5. Okay, we had a, you know a deflection value here. For us, it was actually a separation value. We can just go ahead and use that directly. This separation value of 0.002636. Inches. And we divide this by however much we can tolerate, all right? And that amount we can tolerate is 0 0.005 inch. All of this to the quarter power. Okay, so we'll plug that in, 0.74 times 1.5 times 0 0.004236, all divided by 0 0.005, and raised to the 1 quarter. Okay, so if we boost that diameter up just a little bit, we can make it to our desired uh, design factor, okay? The new diameter that we would need is 0 0.787, we'll say. Okay, does that make sense? That's how you use a, an equation like that on page 717. The real power of the uh, equation on 717 is not actually for this type of case. So this is a really, really simple um, shaft here. And uh, this basically, when you have a simple shaft like this, a lot of times you only need one iteration through equation 717 in order to find what the real new diameter is that you need, okay? 
Um, there are other times where you might have a stepped shaft, right, where it has multiple different diameters to it, and you assume a, a bunch of different diameters for that shaft, and then you, uh, you know, you solve for do I have too much deflection? Okay, well. When you do that, you, you assume a bunch of diameters, solve for if you have too much deflection, and if you have too much deflection, well, what do you do about it? Okay. Well, one of the ways you can deal with it is you can scale up all of your deflections by some amount using an equation like this. Right? And, but if you have multiple different pieces of your shaft, you might have to go through multiple iterations of that, scale them all up, and then figure out what your new deflection might be and if you're there, then great. If you're not, then you might have to go through the iteration again. Okay, so that's where um, I just wanted to mention that an equation like this on 717 can be used iteratively uh, in some more complicated shaft scenarios. Okay, um, one last thing, and then I'll, uh, I'll call it a day for this stuff, and that is, what if I add another question here and say, um, What is the slope? Assuming that you had no slope of the gear, in other words, they, they basically mated with each other perfectly flatly, what's, what kind of slope has now been induced by the fact that this shaft has deflected? I'll say it, the slope of the deflected gear. How do I handle that? Okay. So uh, there's, a, there's a couple things there. One is some of you may remember the tables that were in the uh, statics book that we've used a long time ago. And you might remember that there were slope equations that were directly given in that table. All right, do you all remember that? You probably had to use them actually now and then uh, when you did superposition problems, okay? If you look at the table in the back of this book though, it does not give you any slopes, all right? Why not? Why do you think they don't give you any slopes? Were they just lazy? Oh, maybe, that might have been a part of it, all right? They don't give you any slopes because you don't need them. Why don't you need them? If you have, let's say that you have an equation that defines the shape of a curve, and you want to know another equation that gives you the slope along that curve at any point, all right? Oh, you know how to do that? Is that what you're saying? Okay, yeah, you know how to do that. You know calculus. Right? And so you know what to do to find the slope at a particular point. All right? If you don't know calculus, um, you know, I, uh, I hope that at some point you, you, uh, you decide to learn some, I, although the time is getting short now. Um, no, you, you can just take a derivative and you can end up finding a slope function given the fact that you have these elastic curve functions that are given to you here in the book. And so let's go ahead and, and go back and remember what that function was. I, I think we can probably just start right up here. Okay. All right, this was our function. And we wanted, to, when we were using this function before, we were evaluating it at a very specific x value, right? Where was our x value? Six inches. So everywhere we see this six inches right here, that was, our, uh, that was our value for x, okay? Well, that means that we don't want to just plug that 6 in there whenever we're doing a derivative because that's going to mess us up. But everything else we can keep uh, as, as whatever values they are because the rest of them remain constant, right? But x needs to be treated as if it's a variable, okay? And so what we want to do is we want to figure out what is the slope of this function where 6 inches is actually treated as if it's x, 
right? And what's the slope of this function um, still at a value of x equals 6 inches, okay? And what I want to show you is uh, you should be very grateful for the technology that is allowed to you, okay? So let's put it in here, all right? Some of you may have seen this before. Some of you may have used it before. But there is a derivative tool in the calculator, okay? Some of you may not use this particular calculator, but if you have the, the TI equivalent, it also can do this, okay? So what you do is you put in here this function. I'll go ahead and put the negative value in there. It doesn't really, you know, it might come out positive or negative. We don't care about positive or negative, so anyway, but I'll put it in there. 100 times 8 times what? X over 6 times 30 times 10 to the 6th, okay, times pi times 0.74 to the 4th over 64. get the 64 in just a second, but here we have, let's say, times 14. Now I'll divide by 64. Okay, I think I got all of that in there. And now we multiply this by x squared plus 8 squared minus 14 squared. All right, and we're going to do this at x equals 6 inches. Uh-oh. Did I leave out a parenthesis? Yep, I sure did, didn't I? Okay, so the slope ends up being 5.176 times 10 to the minus 4th. If you don't like to, sometimes it'll give you these results in uh, this scientific notation. Um, this key right here that says ENG, you know, you can actually change what that looks like by hitting ENG. If you hit shift ENG, it moves it the other way. So if you want to see it um, in a different form, it, you can just make it do that. And it basically means we have 0 .0005176, okay, so the slope. Zero, 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 five, one, seven, six. Okay. Well, then, what might be an interesting question to ask now? Okay. How does that look relative to some of the guidelines that we might have uh, seen just a minute ago in Chapter 7? What are the units on slope? Okay, some people say radians, all right? It's not a horrible answer, um, but you might think of slope, the definition of slope is rise over run. Rise would be measured in length, run would be measured in length, so rise over run is unitless, okay? So we don't have to put units on there because it is unitless. All right. So now, uh, uncrowned spur gear, okay? The uh, guideline that they say here is that you should be less than 0 .0005 radians, okay? Now the thing is, a radian is basically the same thing as slope for really small angles, right? Because you think about what the definition of a radian is, it is arc length over radius. Well, that's the same idea as rise over run as long as you have really, really small angles, all right? So we can see that value there and, and directly compare it to the value that we have here. And it says that we might be close to that limit of what would be allowed, okay? We didn't go back and reevaluate it um, after having changed our diameter, right? 
So we used our original diameter to come up with that. It's quite possible that by going to the new diameter, it may uh, have ended up giving us a slope that would have been acceptable. Yeah. As far as like a, a max amount of, so that's on, on page 371, table 7-2, right? Uh, it gives us a few different deflections and slopes and some limits on those that would be acceptable for certain designs, all right? Let me actually say um, another, another thing here about this table because a lot of uh, confusion actually comes from some of the bearing types because there's, whenever you have bearings that are constraining a shaft, um, those bearings, if they are not made to allow angular deflection within the bearing. So if you actually think about, let's say you have a rigidly mounted ball bearing and you have a shaft that comes into that ball bearing and the shaft wants to start sloping. Well, if you have a rigidly mounted ball bearing and that shaft wants to start sloping, it's actually the contact in the balls of the bearing that are gonna try to prevent that slope. And that's usually not a good thing. That usually leads to really early uh, demise of things like ball bearings. And so where it says here, uh, let's say a deep groove ball bearing, this is assuming that that's a rigidly mounted deep groove ball bearing, meaning that the, one of the races is not allowed to pivot at all. One of the races is held rigid, and then the shaft comes in, and the shaft might want to start having a little bit of deflection. What this is saying is those deep groove ball bearings can tolerate up to a thousandth to three thousandth of a radian, um, even if it's rigidly mounted, all right? But you probably don't want to go more than that, okay? How does this compare? You may have actually seen on, our, on my lecture last time that I had said that the bearings were spherically mounted, okay? What do you think that means? Yeah, so what that, what that is is, you know, there's actually a uh, mechanical component that's called a, a pillow block, and they're used a lot in industry. They are basically bearings that take a standard ball bearing, more or less, and mount it uh, inside of a spherical uh, mount. And what that does is it allows you to ignore all of this. It says, you know, we took care of it. We allow that bearing to flex however far it needs to and we don't worry now about loads that are, that are um, induced in the balls of the bearing because we've actually allowed the bearing to flex in that way. Does that make sense? So I wanted to mention for all of these uh, cases that are shown right here, this is for bearings that are actually rigidly mounted, not like spherically mounted pillow blocks, if that makes sense. All right. I think that takes us to the end. I appreciate your attention and I will see you on Wednesday. <laughs>